Apologies for the interruption all. Oh, right, ready to go. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Started a little too early. Uh, so Corey currently serves as head of content management at the University of Texas at Austin Libraries. Dedicated to pushing the boundaries of his field, Corey's work centers on continual improvement of library services and operations. Corey is also the founder of the Library Collective, whose goal is to redefine the professional development landscape for library workers. And Corey's panel consists of Ingrid Reicha, the digital metadata librarian with libraries and cultural resources at the University of Calgary. Ingrid works with metadata management for digital collections and repositories and is hopeful that AI can supplement human metadata creation to help describe the growing digital content in academic libraries. Iona Minshew is head of resource management at the University of Texas at Austin, where she manages operations related to the acquisition, description, and maintenance of continuing and electronic resources. She's passionate about creating strong and equitable partnerships between content creators, publishers, vendors, and libraries. And Professor Sever Bordianu has a master's in library and information science from the University of Texas at Austin, an MA in philosophy and German literature from the University of Mississippi. He's worked in reference and cataloging at the University of Michigan, UC Irvine, and since 1989 at the University of New Mexico, where he's currently director of technical services and outreach librarian for philosophy, religion, foreign languages, and English. All right, so Corey, I will hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, uh, Fred, so much for the introduction, um, and thank everyone for joining us today. As Fred just mentioned, my name is Corey Halechek, and I'll be the facilitator for today's discussion. Um, we've got a great lineup of panelists today uh, to talk about AI and tech services, and I hope you're as thrilled as I am to hear their thoughts and opinions. Um, before we get started with my questions, I just want to take a brief moment to mention a couple of items about the format for today. Uh, first, um, I have some topical questions for discussion to get us started with each panel member, and I'll have other panelists jump in after the first response. Uh, my plan is to cover my questions in roughly 45 to 50 minutes and leave about 10 or 15 minutes or so for questions from the audience. Um, second, uh, our panelists are here to share their personal experiences and opinions. Throughout the day's discussion, uh, you may or may not find yourself agreeing with what they or others have to say. That's okay. Um, differences of opinions and opposing dialogue uh, is always expected and encouraged, but I would ask that we be kind to one another and keep an open mind. Uh, we aren't here necessarily to change minds. We're here to listen and gain insight into our colleagues' perspectives and experiences. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Iona, Ingrid, and Sever, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'd like to start off the questions by discussing what the current landscape of AI and libraries looks like and what we can expect from AI technologies as they relate to the work performed specifically by technical services staff. So e-resources librarians, catalogers, metadata specialists, acquisitions folks, licensing folks, um, all kind of back of house folks. Uh, and so Ingrid, um, I'd like to go ahead and start with you. And I'd like to ask, uh, can you provide examples of any AI applications that have been implemented or currently being tested in cataloging metadata management or other technical services areas? Um, and what are the potential future applications at AI and libraries? How might they revolutionize the way libraries perform technical services work? Yeah, thank you so much, Corey. Um, so I think I'm just going to dive in because that's just how I usually go in life. Um, I think some of the, the AI uh, tools that we currently use, at least at the University of Calgary, um, we use like a handwriting transcription tool, Transcribus, that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, we end up generating a lot of like plain text documents of correspondences that we have in our digital collections. Um, so we've used that, but we've also, when we use that, it's usually supplemented by some sort of human intervention to kind of look at the, the, hand, the, the text that's generated by it um, and correct it. Um, we had a project recently around like HG Wells where we had a, an RA that was kind of doing that. Um, I think one of the other super common tools that that we get used in digital collections is like optical character recognition, which is, you know, kind of an old school or older school uh, use of AI, right? Um, it's been around for a while. We see that in, in PDFs for searching uh, in, our, in our digital asset management system. Um, and some other common tools that I find that we use are like 
you know, I use open refine all the time for doing sort of data cleaning and stuff like that. Um, more recently, uh, we've started to have some of our developers and people sort of in spatial and numeric data services using chat GPT to write Python scripts to do uh, some other kind of deduplication work in, in things, you know, in asset management, stuff like that, which is interesting. I have not been involved in that to date, but I definitely anticipate that I will end up being involved in it. Um, we also have within the digital asset management system that we have, which is a product uh, from Orange Logic, it's called Cortex. Um, we have like some image deduplication services that are kind of built into it, uh, which allow us to kind of easily find duplicates throughout our many, many assets, uh, which has been useful for us. Um, so that's kind of like the general things that are currently in use. Um, in terms of future uses, um, so we had looked at or I'd done like a case study about a product or not a product, but an open source software that uh, the folks at the University of Utah had built uh, around image description um, and generating titles. And we had sort of tested and done a feasibility study around that. Uh, but I think we'd like to implement some sort of a solution like that. We have object detection built into our digital asset management system as well, but we've yet to really test it. Um, and some like keyword generation, but a lot of the keywords that we get uh, for our digital assets are, are pretty basic keywords. You know, they're not necessarily super useful in the discovery process. I mean, knowing that the grass is green is is great, I suppose but I'm not really sure what kind of value that provides to our, to our users, um, though, I, though there is value in it, right? Um, we also, I should say, we've also been using like a, a speech to text recognition to generate captions for some of our kind of like research data management, like slideshows that we have in our digital asset management system that are generated by librarians. Um, and we will probably be looking at using that on some of our oral history projects as well um to kind of you know auto generate a transcription of of audio files um what else do we have um yeah i mean the 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 cortex system by by orange logic has a lot of third party services uh from azure built into it so all of the ones that were kind of just mentioned in the last uh last presentation there are kind of within that like it has like a summary summary text. It's got facial recognition, which we've been very hesitant to turn on when we've tested some of that. There's there's other implications for that that, you know, are kind of more around sensitive content and like what what that looks like when we've tried to test it. It's been it's been kind of hit or miss about what it pulls out, um, having some sort of value laden descriptors in there as well. <laughs> uh, so kind of figuring out how to do that. So I feel like that's a kind of maybe a general summary of what we what we have. Um, yeah, some oh, with some logo detection, explicit content kind of things as well in our digital asset management system. Um, I feel like how revolutionize things or change the landscape, like I think the potential to make make things easier or make, like I said, I'm hopeful that it will help with sort of descriptions. Um, and sort of producing content for, for our digital assets. But I think that there's still, like there's always going to be, I think a fair bit of human intervention that's needed there. So um, I feel like finding the balance between uh, sort of how much these technologies can do for us at the moment and how much work we have to sort of put in to, to get the results that, that we would want, that we would find sort of, for lack of a better word, like acceptable for use um, is, is sort of one of, one of the, the pain points right now, you know? So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank um, you so much. Yeah. Um, Iona or Suber, would you like to chime in? I can kind of expand um, on uh, what we're experimenting in my unit, and that is using chat GPT to write Python scripts to have a better handle on 
um, our electronic resource management. I'm specifically going to use ebooks because that's what I've done a lot of experimenting with um, and licensing. Um, we've been trying to utilize J Chat GPT as an assistant to fill a lot of our gaps. Um, in you know, in the past twenty or so years, there's just been a huge boom in volume in our collections, our content, but there's not necessarily been um, an increase in the human labor. Um, we've really relied on technology or having so much that it's constant cleanup and things like that. So I see AI as a potential to like fill a gap that's been there for a while that needs to be filled so that we can actually move forward um, with a lot of our strategic goals and plans. So with ebook management specifically, we've been trying to um, extend the capacity of our unit by having a uh, we started with our doc, like making extremely detailed documentation and feeding that to chat GPT and seeing what it could write, um, what it could do in our spreadsheets, um, finding duplicates across our DDA and EBA plans, um, finding records that need to be upgraded um, because they have no subject fields. Um, lots of just things that we want to do as a unit that we've never been able to do. Um, there's, we are very much in the experimental phase with that right now. Um, we've seen that it does, re even with someone knowledgeable about Python um, and G Chad GPT's capacity, it still requires a lot of human touch. Um, so we're trying to find a way where Chat GPT actually um, takes on the workload and doesn't expand it or just change it. Um, because if it's going to just be the same amount of workload. And that's not exactly the end goal that we're having. We're trying to use it in a very like practical way to um, let our librarians do more human focused work and take away a lot of the, um, what I would say, like it's not like soul crushing work, but it's work that's meant for a computer. It's not meant for a human to do, um, but we're having to do it to manage our digital and electronic collections. Um, so trying to kind of think about it on a both a practical and philosoph philosophical level, like what work is, um, is kind of all the things we're looking at as we experiment just what chat GPT can do. Um, but we're seeing um, a big gap in kind of where it's at now and what coding can do and how that can kind of feed into our automated systems. Um, more successfully, though, if we go to the acquisition side, um, licensing, we've been using it as like a law, like um, aid. Um, it's been able to find um, problematic uh, terms for us that we've been able to kind of like just through our own documentation feed chat GBT. And it's almost like it gives us a highlighted version of what we need to take an extra look at um, and has greatly and like sped up. The, our ability to read um, and process uh, licenses through that, which kind of just expands the capacity of our e-resource unit. Um, so yeah, very much a practical experimental. University of Texas kind of gave us a little bit of guidelines with ChatGPT, um, but for the most part, we've been doing it a lot on our own um, independently, just seeing what actually works from the ground up rather than like, getting like a blanket system going for the whole libraries. <clears throat> Excellent, thanks, Iona. Um, Sever, any thoughts on current technologies or future potential? Uh, I think there's a lot of future potential. The current technologies, and we're in pretty much the same situation as Iona mentioned, we're allowed to use it, but we haven't been given a mandate. So I've been, uh, experimenting on certain projects. And I think like any cataloger, uh, you know, I started with really basic things when I started learning it, you know, catalog a book for me and give it to me in mark format, RDA, et cetera. How good is the record? And several of us did this. And I think it's human, you know, some of us, some people thought it's pretty good. Others thought not good at all. Of course, it was never perfect. And certainly at this time, I don't anticipate uh, 
having ChatGPT catalogs books from scratch. There's many articles where, yes, you can do it, and it could be maybe for very short records in a small library with very little expertise. It'll give you a workable record. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things we have, uh, we have really powerful tools, you know, uh, from the Library of Congress and uh, OCLC that do a lot of the catalog classification plus, you know, which everything is linked together. So I haven't yet uh, looked to see how we can implement ChatGPT to make these tools even more useful and usable. Uh, but I see that uh, I'll probably have to experiment with that. So I haven't really... Uh, implemented anything specifically to streamline cataloging. Uh, but what I'm working on actually is more of a maintenance type thing. Uh, my big goal is to uh, take all the procedures we have and we've had for many years and some of them need to be updated. Uh, as you know, procedures are very tedious. You know, you have to go through each one and kind of develop a program so that ChatGPT can bring them up to date. Uh, what I'm waiting for now, and I still need to learn it, is how to incorporate graphics. A lot of our procedures have screenshots, and some of them can be 10 years old. You know, yeah, you can go and bring new ones, but will it be able to actually update them based on the information? I'm reading a lot that there is technology there that can do it. I have not been able to learn it or implement it yet. But that's my uh, goal towards this. And also at the University of New Mexico in, my tech, in the tech services department, what I like to do is use chat GPT and AI in general or, you know, whichever program we end up using, not just to update the procedures, but also to organize them in a really logical way. Uh, over the years, we've had different things. One's the acquisition folder, but then there's another one in the e-resource folder, but should they be cross-linked or you know, does it belong in the other one? And we've spent a lot of time on that, but you know, we haven't really had time, I haven't had time to bring everything up to date. So that's my major thing. And uh, the last thing I wanna say, it's definitely a work in progress. Every day I read something new. And when I have the time and, you know, to actually get the team, you know, to work on it, um, I think there's a lot of potential there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, just as a follow up. So it's been my experience in the, and I think I'm going on 13 years kind of working in technical services departments that those departments tend to shrink over time. Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of potential with AI, but in listening to the three of you talk, um, I'm curious what your thoughts on how do we balance uh, the time of our, our technical services staff in policing or enhancing or learning about this um, when we already have not enough folks to do the existing work. So any, any one of you can jump in with that. Well, I think I can start because that was our big dilemma, you know, when the dean encouraged us and we happened to be one of uh, our dean is very interested in, you know, uh, our department and our library, our university to, you know, to be on the forefront of this. And it didn't even occur to me to ask, but in the general meeting, you know, from everybody else in the library, they were saying, who's going to do it and where will they get the time to do it? So we made the time, some of us, not all. But what I realized, you know, I was one of the people that was part of the pilot project. It does take a lot of time. And many times I just didn't have time to do it right. So there is definitely a dilemma there. You can do things because you're interested, you know, and you work whatever hours. Uh, but yes, that's definitely a dilemma. The other thing, when I'm, I know we're all struggling with this, and it's in the news in every industry, will it take jobs away from us? And one of the issues I'm struggling with, and I'm a supervisor, our staff has shrunk over the years, you know, from 28 to like six, it would be nice to get more people hired, but if the administration says, well, AI can do the job, you don't need more, uh, you know, uh, first of all, right now it can't, 
but it may in the future. So I think that's definitely something we need to keep in, in mind. And also the people who are working, you know, are our jobs being threatened because we're becoming obsolete? I don't think it's the case yet, but it's a definite issue. And I'm sure you're all struggling with the same, you know, how do you sell this project? How do you get people to, uh, you know, get on board with working with it? Thank you. Um, I own her, Ingrid. Yeah, so I think um, having to make, you know, ethical decisions revolving about labor and pay equity and kind of just the meaning of work are going to have to be handled before or at the same time of AI implementation. Um, I think libraries are going to, in higher ed and businesses, like everyone that's dealing with this is going to have to adopt a new idea of work adopt a new idea of what a job is. Um, what I'm seeing personally is a lot of um, good jobs being eliminated and then later relisted as lower um, classification jobs or targeted towards um, kind of populations that are at a disadvantage, um, grad students, things like that. Um, and then paying not a livable wage giving them conditions and workloads that are unsustainable. Um, and I think those are going to have to be handled at um, before we implement AI. Um, and I think there is potential for actually better jobs to be created because of AI. Um, if we change our skills, um, managing AI, database management, all of those are still jobs that are needed um, and are going to be needed and are going to be you know, uh, good for all industries. Um, so kind of promoting better jobs and letting the AI take on workloads of lower paid and classified jobs is there's a discussion there in there um, as well. But yeah, I think just the idea changing the idea of what work is um, is going to be a big conversation with AI. Excellent. Thanks, Iona. So sticking with that, um, my my next question is actually about ethics. Um, so you just made a really good segue for me there, Iona. Thank you. Um, and so I'll stick with you for a moment, Iona. Uh, but beyond um, the changing of work and beyond the, the labor issues, um, what other ethical considerations do you think uh, library tech services folks um, should be concerned about when it comes to implementing AI? Um, and how can we ensure accountability, uh, especially when there's errors or unintended consequences that, that occur? Yeah, I think two major um, ethical concerns and one I'm better suited to uh, talk about, um, and that'll be the second one I mentioned, but the first is just the, the pace at which AI learns and develops. I think it, there's a lot of problems with how fast it moves. Um, and I know that there are other libraries um, that are kind of just concerned with what we just don't know the output of AI because it's just, it's learning and moving so fast. So there's no control or predictability. And if we have set goals for our library and our data management and things, there's the potential for AI to, to run away and kind of not really meet those goals. Um, but what I see more is um, the ethical like dilemmas of the vendors that are in positions to create um, the AI software they're going to sell us and being in those conversations and being part of stakeholders in that development and not allowing them to go unpoliced during that, this process of the, the creation of products that they're going to sell us and being in those conversations and understanding better um, what they can do for the libraries or what maybe they can't do for the libraries that they're gonna try to sell us anyways. Um, so I see there just a lot of um, kind of dilemma or problems that could, if not monitored, just our big vendors could run with um, and leave libraries behind. Excellent, thank you. Um, Ingrid and Sever, maybe a follow-up uh, for you, but also feel free to answer my, my first questions um, since you're both involved in catalog and metadata. Um, what kind of measures do you think we should be putting in place to address bias uh, in the classification um, of diverse literature resources that we have? And are there ways that you can think of um, that easily can be put in place 
uh, that can actively involve folks from marginalized communities in helping us develop or evaluating the AI tools that we're using? Um, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I think it's an interesting question because I think, you know, a lot of AI models that we see, especially when we've looked at some of the descriptive terms that come out for, for marginalized or racialized groups, um, like the AIs don't, don't produce good, good content here, right? Um, and largely because I think they're developed by a particular population. Um, and sometimes I like, I see in one hand, a real place for, for academic institutions to become involved in the development of, of better terminology um, and better terms to, to describe people. Um, and I also, you know, we've been doing a fair bit of work uh, up here in Canada around like uh, reconciliation and decolonization and indigenization. Uh, and I think, you know, we need to have those populations involved in, in developing some of those those terms and in replacing some of the, the really harmful language that does come out of, of AIs and continues to be perpetuated through the use of AI. Um, so I think there's there's a, a great place for, for academics and uh, and librarians to, to become involved in that work. But at the same time, as was previously mentioned, I think you also don't want to put that labor on onto marginalized groups um, and kind of, you know, make that part of what they're supposed to be doing because that's that's not fair to do either. So I think, you know, we really need to find a way to strike a balance there. Um, and I mean, even just stepping away from sort of the marginalized and racialized fact of things like, you know, we've run images through some of these facial recognition softwares and sometimes the output that you get, like it'll be describing a woman or something and it'll be like, Oh, pretty. And you're like, this is a very value laden, like descriptor, you know, this is not just, you know, so you kind of just end up perpetuating stereotypes oftentimes, I think through the use of, of AI models as they currently stand. But again, I think there's room for, for sort of some of the, the work of, of librarians and academics to, to feed into a better, a better development of AI and hopefully with the considerations that that we we need to have uh you know um that's yeah I'm not really sure exactly but i'd like to see see that as a partnership at some point um you know not sure exactly how we do that but yeah, yeah. Fair, fair enough um sever any thoughts on that uh well my thoughts on that are as you said we need cooperation and we need a really broad approach. Uh, we go to library leadership, you know, PCC, NACO, BIPCO, the big authority files, and we can contribute our own way with some smaller authority files that start populating this AI universe. How it's used, you know, uh, that's obviously up to the technology. So um, I have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of hope or at least I see it happening, you know, at the leadership level at the, from the Library of Congress and the uh, NACO PCC group uh, to address some of these issues. Uh, I personally don't see, I realize AI can make a difference, but how one library can really impact the entire profession, I, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, in terms of AI, what I have found through, you know, uh, it doesn't create new, it just kind of rehashes all the information that it's had and it has algorithm how to, how to process it. So as long as that information is there and it has nothing new, it can't come up with better algorithms. And I think we need to start populating it through our authority files, whatever we create. But again, that's down, you know, it's done at the individual level. <laughs> when we create an authority record, when we load up a local file with the prop, you know, with the correct terminology that's much more appropriate. And then it needs to be incorporated into this universe. So um, I think it's going to eventually happen, but I don't think we're there yet. So to me, uh, we still need to be very vigilant and make sure it does not provide uh, the wrong information or worse. Well, thank you so much. Um, 
So keeping on the theme of partnerships that all of you kind of touched on um, in various ways, um, Sever, I'll stick with you you for this one to get the ball rolling on this question. Um, you mentioned Library of Congress, right? Ditko, PCC, stuff like that. Um, and that's that's great. That's kind of a national level organization that can kind of take data and do that. Um, it sounds like based on, on some of your comments just across the board here, um, that there's a lot of, of good ideas perhaps um, and partnerships existing with, with current vendors uh, that we already have that may be developing these tools. Um, how might we as libraries lead the way in having these conversations with vendors instead of, um, which has been my experience in so many ways where, where it's the other way around, we're given these tools and we're told these are the best tools for you. You know, how can we kind of flip the script on that and be partners in developing it? Um, and then also uh, just from kind of across institutional uh, conversations, how do we work and remove some of those barriers so that the University of Texas might work with the University of New Mexico, right? And, and kind of work together to develop these on our own. You know, I'm going to use it cliche, but communication is probably the most important thing. Obviously, we're talking right now. <laughs> uh, I'm meeting a lot of people that I have not, uh, you know, met before, and we know we have the same interests. Uh, but going back to the national organizations, obviously, the Library of Congress, PCC, BIPCO, NACO is one of the major projects, but it's by no means the only one. And they're connected, you know, with VIAF, with many of the other groups that can uh, that create content and you know uh obviously they have to negotiate how they do things but they do have really good communication the europeans of course and countries you know in in the uh, the other countries uh in asia uh there's got to be a lot of cooperation and i'm not quite as plugged in at ifla but i would imagine uh you know they have a lot of emphasis on these type of things as well and uh with vendors, what I find, first of all, the vendors do go to the same meetings. You know, they come to the PCC meetings, they go to, you know, ALA, ACRL, and there's a good uh, good communication or good contact with the vendors. Uh, I think the, the problem with the vendors is generally we talk to salespeople who, you know, they, they have a product. And I think somehow we need to get involved more with the people that actually create the content and maintain it, not just the people that sell it to us. And uh, I didn't think about this until you asked the question. Uh, I think we need to kind of get past the sales PR person people and get to the content creators and the ones that actually decide, you know, what is the thesaurus I'm going to use or whatever it happens to be and uh, have a lot broader communication there. Uh, from my experience with the vendors we work together today, whether it's, uh, you know, content, you know, EBSCO, ProQuest, whoever they are, they're very open to this. But again, uh, you know, they have limited staff and we interact with them in certain contexts. And up to, to now, I not so much in the context that we're talking about ethical uh, data and terminology. Great, thank you. Um, I owner Ingrid, would you like to chime in? Yeah, I can. Um, as far as working with vendors and other, um, and kind of just collabor collaborating across institutions, I think one thing that's going to be of like extreme importance is including um, the people that are going to be most affected by the use of the product in the conversations. Um, so I don't think much is going to happen if we just send our library directors and assistant directors and the like the lead of a prod like from the vendor to these conferences. It's just I see a lot of talking going on um, and not a, a lot of actual action of um, and use. And so I think getting the people like he said, the content creators, the, the people that are actually using um, and creating this technology at the bottom being in conversation with leaders and then being in conversations like outside of like kind of just starting small in communities and then building that out um, slowly is going to be better than 
just creating another task force to um, report and publish a paper on AI. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm with AI specifically, I see a lot of um, usefulness of including the skill, the knowledge uh, workers um, and not just the leaders of institutions in these conversations and that being essential to good um, practices and collaborations. Great, thank you. Um, Ingrid, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think I think partnership, it's kind of, it happens at every level, right? In the sense of, you know, when we were uh, test the one sort of locally hosted AI that was developed by the University of Utah, it was like a partnership between myself and like a developer within within our library. And I needed that developer to do to do the work that I was doing. Um, and they were sort of key, but I think we need, like, I mean, our, our library, like our vice provost or the head of our library, um, is definitely in support of AI, uh, and so on and so forth. But then at the same time, I feel like we kind of, to the point of like labor resources and stuff, we need the time to kind of put in, put in the work, um, to kind of make those partnerships, whether that's within our own institutions or across institutions, I think that there's a lot of room for some cross cross institution collaborations, um, like around a lot of this work. When I was at uh, the Code for Lib conference, sort of presenting about this, you know, a lot of people were sort of like, "We should we should sort of use some of these natural language processing models and develop them develop them for library use, as opposed to sort of maybe even just waiting for vendors to do that." But in order to do that. We need the time to do that. And is it is that our job? I'm not really sure, right? Um, I don't have the expertise to do that. I would be relying very heavily on development staff within our own library or in other institutions to help with that. Um, so I think it's kind of, I don't know, looking at, at where that work is going to get done and how we're going to going to use the resources that we have and if we're going to partner with vendors to do some of this thing, like I'm not, mm, I'm not sure how, I don't do a lot of work with vendors. So first of all, I don't have a lot to say about that in general, <laughs> I would, I would say, but at the same time, I think that there's, there's got to be a way to do that. I mean, we've talked to Amazon about some of their handwriting stuff because we were looking at testing a different software there. Um, and I think, I think, and I would hope that, you know, the impetus to want to develop products for for our profession to some degree um, would have enough potential uses through these vendors that they would be interested in doing so. Um, and I don't think that they wouldn't be, you know what I mean? So I think we just have to start some of those conversations with some of these, these larger organizations. Um, yeah, separate because I think your point is very well taken. And, you know, we're talking about tech services here. And as tech services, we're both creators of data when we do cataloging, metadata, et cetera, and users of data when we, you know, we buy uh, content from vendors. And I think as creators, we're doing a fairly good job in a small way because we're a small part of this information universe. But, you know, through our authority files and, you know, all the work we put in there and we know it's good faith, lots and lots of effort to make them as good as possible and up to date and not offensive, et cetera, et cetera. Now with the vendors, when we buy things, we can talk to them, but again, uh, I myself don't really know how many indexes do they have? How how many people work on creating and maintaining their thesauri and each one has their own. Uh, and I think we definitely have a lot more work to do there to bridge that gap. And uh, that's basically what I want to say. Thank you, awesome. Um, so I think a lot of, a lot of room for uh, maybe conversations in the future with vendors to to think about how we contribute um, and then cross kind of pollination between institutions as well. Um, so I wanna move on because I do wanna leave some time for uh, questions from the audience. Um, so uh, my last question um, will actually be for, for all three of you, um, but it's more moving away from HI or AI and switching more to the, the human components um, and how AI will impact 
those of us that work in technical services um, and the teams that we lead. Um, and I'll start, go ahead and start with you, Iona. Uh, but what role uh, can professional development opportunities play in promoting a mindset of adaptability and curiosity in the face of evolving AI uh, capabilities? And um, how can we also be proactive in addressing staff concerns or misconceptions about AI and how it might you know, replace them or impact their jobs in negative ways? Yeah, um, the continuous learning one uh, is something that really, I, sh I think I struggle with um, myself and in my unit uh, because like we've said before, it's like, how do we create the space to learn and change and upgrade our skills um, while at the same time re continuing to give the same um, output on our workload and um, just the day-to-day -day duties. And I think what's going to have to happen is a real um, look at, like it goes back to like work and what's essential and learning, finding ways to either experience cut out duties or expand the unit in in ways that give um people the time that's the thing is we need the time but we don't want to add on to people's day i actually want to reduce people's day i, I think smaller work weeks and things have um potential to give us um i guess capacity to take on learning um, because we need time to not only learn something and go to conferences and classes, but actually practice the skills. Um, and then we also need to give, we have to, as both supervisors and librarians, give people the confidence to know like they can learn these, that a lot of um, AI management and uh, kind of these future technologies actually like cool, like are skills they already know and they just have to kind of adapt them and giving people the confidence to that it will be a step in addressing misconceptions and fears um i think it's going to have to almost work backwards where people are going to have to work with the ai almost before their fears are going to be addressed um so it might be a little bit of like dipping toes in the water but i think that's why experiment phases are nice because we like it, it's out there. AI is out there. Everyone's afraid of it right now. Um, that's also an opportunity to learn how to kind of control it um, and address the fears. And it's going to have to happen, you know, on an individual level. Um, and obviously, in every field and everything, when there's change, there are people that are resistant to it. Um, and that that's just going to be there. But also, I think just giving people the confidence to um use AI and not being like not having people disconnected from it um, and having decisions made for them will be important in um kind of helping staff get on board with new initiatives. Excellent. Thanks, Iona. Um Ingrid. Yeah, so a couple of things. Um I, I mean I'm fairly fairly young in my profession. I've been in my role for about six years and it's my first, you know, professional job. Um, but I do remember since I've started um, and my job was ori originally in like a cataloging unit and has since sort of moved to a digital digital collections unit. But since I started and when I started, there was a lot of fear around like AI replacing technical services work. Right. And there, I think there, there continues to be to some degree. Um, I think. One thing that I heard out of sort of a panel within within our institution that I really, really liked from um, somebody who works sort of on our, on our front desk and uses the chat bot, right? And is kind of in charge of helping to, to get that, you know, up, up to snuff was kind of reframing what AI really is in the sense of what, what they called it and which I really like was statistical guessing, right? Um, and I think in some ways that that really is what it is, right? Like, I mean, you can call it artificial intelligence. What do you quantify and qualify intelligence as exactly? I'm not not 100% sure. But I think taking sort of some of the the humanity out of like the artificial intelligence and the loaded loaded words that are used there can actually help with that destigmatization and with with getting 
some staff to sort of maybe be a little bit less afraid of it replacing replacing work because I think I think that's sometimes where it is. And I think the other thing is um, if you can get sort of technical services staff on board with helping to, to sort of, I don't know, upskill our statistical guessing softwares. Um, I think that that's like, because the work that they do is is invaluable and it's it's got a lot of, there's a lot of tacit knowledge sort of built into that that work of, of cataloging and description. And if we can sort of harness that and use that to inform AIs, I think that that reframes the question as like, how can how can technical services staff help to improve AIs as opposed to being, how can, you know, is, is this AI gonna take, take our, our job? It might be that AI takes away some of those more rigorous labor intensive tasks from, from, from technical services staff, which I think in many ways we'd all be happy to have, you know, that happen. Um, and to to really think about some of those questions that that I think most catalogers really like to think about in terms of applying, you know, subject headings or applying how to describe things in a in a meaningful way, um, and using using our technical services staff to inform the AIs to do that, I think might be might be one way to do that. Not really sure. Excellent. Thank you, Ingrid. Yeah. Uh, Sever. I don't think I can add that much insight because everything's already been said, which was truly excellent. I think uh, all of us, uh, when we're faced with a new technology, especially when it appears so ominous and disruptive to what we've been doing and we feel comfortable and knowing and the possibility of replacing us, everybody's going to be hesitant. And one thing that I've noticed uh People were both reluctant, but very curious to learn about it. And I think one of the things that, uh, you know, kind of gets some of the fears away to let, you know, give people the opportunity to learn it and experiment to see really how powerful or how weak it really is. Uh, what I've learned by doing this is that currently it's really not uh it's not endangering anybody's uh, jobs or skills because it cannot replace what a human does in terms of doing cataloging or even ordering books. Uh, but we can refine it for later, you know, to take away those tedious jobs, whatever they may be, you know, if you have to click 200 times to, to accomplish, you know, 200 tasks, but it's all the same, uh, that would be truly fantastic. One thing that I haven't seen it yet, and for us in tech services, the intellectual content and everything uh, is the fun part, right? And we don't need that one automated, even though it may be doing it better in the future. But it's the repetitive tasks, you know, of creating an item record, placing a barcode, you know, printing the web. Will we be able to get to where it will do that? And I think that would be a really great leap forward in relieving some of the really repetitive and sometimes even not so healthy, you know, uh, mouse clicks and all that kind of stuff. I don't think we're there yet, or if we are, I have not yet been able to do that. I want to make one quick comment. This is me going around. Uh, 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 this has been going on for quite a while. And AI in the older days, uh, you know, has already been applied to medicine. So the doctors feel threatened because they, IBM had de developed a program that could actually diagnose this very specific disease to 99% accuracy. And the doctors would only do 80%. They resented that. And again, would you, you know, who decides the computer is better, uh, don't go to a human or do we have the human do it. And I think we're going to, we're starting to see that in tech services and librarians, at which point is the computer be better than me? And then I become obsolete. We're not there yet, but I think those are real fears. And the only way to do it is let everybody who has the time and is interested, experiment with it to know what we're talking about. Because otherwise, uh, if it's a mystery, then people will resent it. Excellent, thank you. So not to use the library cliche, but information is power, right? And so allowing people to, to experiment and become familiar with it, excellent. Um, those are all the, the formal questions I have. Um, so I'd love to turn it over to questions from the audience. 
Uh, we've had a couple come in. Um, so the first one, uh, and anybody who wants to answer this or um, elaborate, please feel just to, to go for it. Um, but this is from Nathan uh, Tallman. Um, and Nathan writes, many library vendors are also in the data selling business and compile in-depth dossiers on everyone that law enforcement and others, landlords, employers, and more can pay to access. Uh, it seems like with AI, they would be able to start mixing those data sets and sharing what people are reading um, or accessing. Uh, can you address the ethics here and how we can protect patron privacy? And I would add that maybe, um, maybe you'd also want to comment since we talked a little bit about maybe possibly partnering with vendors, how we just protect uh, data in, in general um, as we think about how we're, we're using AI or sharing information. Um, so anybody who would like to take a, take a stab at that, go for it. I can take a stab a little bit. Um, what we do currently at UT um, is I've worked with um, obviously Corey, but um, we have our partners in the scholarly resources unit um, and also with um, like organizations like Spark and stuff and have a clear understanding of what our contracts say, um, what we can negotiate and what vendors are problematic in their data practices and what which ones are not in buying as much as we can from the ones that are um, have better uh, protections for us. I think larger universities and libraries are going to have to step up in their um, purchasing kind of uh, decisions and discernment on um, the vendors we use and use our power. Um, you know, money is power. Um, the institutions that have the money and that are purchasing these need to kind of show our you know, use our power to negotiate stronger um, data protections um, or we don't purchase. And, you know, the library is ever evolving. We can survive um, and ev evolve. We don't have to take um, these, you know, bad terms from vendors um, if we are, if we work together and work strategically. So I think, you know, just looking at what we're starting at the purchase and the acquisition um, is going to be important um, in protecting the privacy of, you know, not only our our patrons, but just of everyone that's using data, like in general, it's, it's going to, you know, we affect what happens in the world too. So. Thank you. Um, Sever. Uh, UNM has definitely very strong guidelines, which is from the campus IT and the library works closely with them. They're part of that group. Uh, any kind of data that we purchase uh, when it's used by, you know, UNM, the UNM community, very strong protections uh, for data privacy. And it's an ongoing discussion. It's incredibly complicated. Uh, currently, when we sign contracts uh, with vendors or service providers, it has to go through many, many levels of approval. I'm working on one now. We've been working for three months. We're almost there. But there's that many level of approvals from IT. Uh, and they're looking at how is user data shared with the vendor? What do they do with it? And, you know, obviously... Uh, how how much they have access to that they need, you know, to run the system and the rest doesn't. Uh, there are systems in place. I don't think they're perfect, but uh, the campus is definitely aware. I just want to make one other super quick comment. And at UNM, it's actually a campus-wide, university-wide, as AI is being used for a, a variety of different applications. Uh, we are they're working on developing guidelines. You know, if you use AI to write a report or write, uh, you know, a recommendation, you need to indicate that it was used. Problem is that uh, it's not that easy to use it and we have been cautioned not to use it. If there's any kind of personal information in a report, because once you put it through AI, they own the data and we've lost the privacy thing. So we're very, very careful with that. Now that's a slightly different issue than tech services, but with tech services, we're working on pro protecting the privacy of our users because we maintain the database of users and we're making those efforts, uh, you know, to the best of our abilities, of course. Sure, great, thank you. Um, 
So sticking kind of with with licensing, uh, and I own it, maybe you would like to tackle this one first, because I know you're doing a lot um, on our end here at Texas with licensing terms. Um, but Alex writes in, uh, we're seeing AI terms starting to be added into resources terms of use, uh, usually prohibiting users from using resources in coordination with AI. Uh, there was very little guidance on this in the library world. Uh, have you all had this experience um, and how are you dealing with it? Yeah, so that's a new one. And that's actually where I see so much opportunity for um, collaboration. Specifically, I, I think in the public library world, it'll look differently, but at, at least for the, at the university level, um, partnering with there, there's other in there's other colleges and schools and like our, I'm especially our business contracts office partnering with someone there who is passionate about these and giving um having both like the legal the librarian um the IT all together in constant collaboration to address these concerns because yeah they're fair they're they are fairly new um we haven't seen it uh come up and be problematic yet but we know it's there um i've talked to you know our head of collection development and things they want um and you know potential problems so i think just this comes naturally in e-resources but it's just such an important thing when talking about ai is being in partnership and collaboration with the other people that are going to be affected and a part of it um because we like i said we are all doing so many different things and we can't do everything librarians can't be everything for everyone um we have to stop that menta mentality um we have to work with others and and i think just i think lawyers and um kind of just stakeholders in our field are going to be important in addressing this early on because yeah I don't know exactly what to do yet that's fair um I think we're all still trying to figure that out uh so we're about four minutes three minutes left um Ingrid there is a not a question but a comment um for you uh about um leveraging staff's experience and knowledge to train AI, uh, AI as being wonderful um and looking for ways to use that information uh for training data for AI tools um, so I think just to wrap up, I just have one, one question I'll just throw out there for all of you. Uh, since Iona, you kind of touched on this a second ago with like, we can't do everything by ourselves. Um, and so, you know, we're having this conversation today and Anu has put on this great conference. Um, for each of you, how do we, how do we keep this conversation going? Um, and how do we continue to build and foster a sense of community around tech services and AI? Um, Ingrid, you want to go first? Put you on the spot. You can see. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, I think the conversation will keep going. Uh, it's, I think it's a very pertinent issue, sort of, you know, and very timely issue. Um, and I think, you know, AI is going to continue to be, to be a part of our, our world, uh, whether we like it or not. Um, so, but I think, I think how we, how we continue to have like, a kind of collaborative relationship is really what what interests me here, right? How how do we build the resources between our institutions for for the library profession um, and for our users as well uh, to kind of keep that going? And I I don't know, like I think I wanna I don't know start some some initiatives to to kind of I don't know build some some AI tools that that would be useful to tech services um, or, or make them better for tech services. Um, I, I see little, little bits of this happening here and there from offshoots from places, but uh, I don't know. I think we need to, to have a, a larger community of, of practice somehow um, that, that does that um, start building, building communities in that sense. Right that that tackle and i think tackling like the the issues that that are relevant to us right because i mean we all have different things that's the other thing right like what what are you interested in right what what's the thing that you're interested in collaborating on because sometimes you get to these working groups that are gigantic and we have 18 different issues and none of them nobody engages because there's too many things and maybe they're not the thing that they're interested in so i don't know dedicated spaces of some sort yeah great um iona or sever very quick last minute thoughts on building community. I always start locally. 
Um, so for us, it's Texas. I've worked with the e-resources people at Texas A&M, at Texas Tech, um, state institutions specifically that are dealing with the same policies statewide um, and funding and all of that. So finding like-minded, um, like not just like your partner institutions, like across like the U.S., but like people that are actually dealing with the same same issues you are um, and tackling it from there and then going outwards. Excellent. Thanks. Saber, 10 second response. All of the above. I totally, uh, I totally agree. Uh, local, national, and conferences like this, uh, what a way to finish. <laughs> conferences like this is so important. That's when we talk and then we'll probably create connections and, you know, continue other, uh, you know, other communication offline afterwards and go with projects. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, all so much um, for your time today. Thanks, panelists, for joining us.